Okay. <laughs> well, this might seem a bit surprising, but um, I'm a little bit nervous because um, I have never s given a talk on Klebnikov before, and I've given lots of talks. And it's not because Klebnikov isn't important to me, it's almost because he's too important, rather close to the bone. And as I was going through um, my notes, previous notes on Klebnikov and my um, dissertation on Klebnikov, um, it was just coming to me how much of an influence Klebnikov must have been on me that I, I kind of didn't kind of realize. Almost everything I've done, apart from the fairly straightforward Marxism, Leninism, Trotskyism of my life, of which I'm very proud, <laughs> all the features of my political adventures, which many of my colleagues possibly have felt a bit, you know, puzzled by, even sometimes said, Chris, this seems slightly deranged, isn't it? Um, I've just realized that <laughs> lunacy, the government of the dead, um, the uh, 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 um, regiment of songs, the idea of a planet governed by rhythm, uh, the, the, the need for laughter as, the, as an antidote. I mean, when you get really, really angry about what wretches are doing, I don't know, the bankers are doing, or capitalists are doing, or employers are doing, the, the importance of trying to laugh, find a way of, of laughing to just somehow change the whole dynamic. So many things about Klebnikov which I hadn't quite realized were directly um, the source of my thinking. Um, I've, just, I've just kind of realized, well, really, uh, it's almost as if I was at, at, at times kind of almost confused. And in fact, I was a bit confused. I mean, I don't want to talk about myself this evening. This is a talk about Klebnikov. Um, but um, there have been times in my 20s when I wasn't quite sure whether it was Klebnikov or me. And I kind of, um, I, remember f I remember feeling that I was so immersed in Klebnikov, I was getting so excited and so overwhelmed by the, 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 the sort of power of the thinking that I, I thought, well, he is, he is dead. But he did seem to, Klebnikov did seem to think that time is a kind of space and he can go backwards and forwards in time. And maybe in some sort of sense, me and Klebnikov, and I'm, I'm trying to stress the fact that Klebnikov himself is often considered to be a bit deranged. Um, um, I, you know, there's sometimes that border between me and Klebnikov got a bit confused. Um, and I'm, I'm actually quite proud of that because Klebnikov is an absolutely extraordinary figure. And if the revolution had succeeded, if the Russian revolution had not been stopped in its tracks by the catastrophe of what happened in Germany, so the revolution broke out in February 1917 in Russia with the overthrow of the Tsar, and of course the plan of Lenin, Trotsky and the Bolsheviks was that this was the start of the international revolution and the next step had to be Germany. And sure enough, brilliantly, in Germany, in November 1918, the workers rose up against the Kaiser, an opposition to the continuation of the war, overthrew um, the, the German monarchy, set up Soviets, and it looked as if the hopes of the Russian revolutionaries were going to be realized. And then, as everyone knows, I hope everyone knows, some young people don't know these things. What happened, of course, was that Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Leibniz were assassinated and murdered and by the Freikorps, the, 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 the colonel of what then became the, Nazi, the German Nazis. And, uh, of course, the revolution was not um, the success, or it was not the international revolution which the revolutionists themselves had, had hoped it would be. What I'm saying is, is it's it's I'm, I was talking to Kara about this before we started um, to talk about Klebnikov is almost dangerous these days um, you can write about or talk about um, Noam Chomsky and Roman Jakobson but somehow talking about Klebnikov is dangerous because it does you can't you can't discuss Klebnikov without the full scale of the vision for the future that the Russian Revolution represented and it's just bound to be controversial uh, but we also know don't we that history is written, written by the victors and despite uh, what I'm saying is had that revolution succeeded had it spread into Germany had it then spread across Europe had it then spread across the world there's no question that Klebnikov would have been a massive figure that everybody would know about 
Um, but the reality is that almost nobody knows about Klebnikov in the West. Almost nobody. Uh, in, in the East, in Russia, um, I, I should perhaps stress this, Klebnikov is regarded as an extraordinary poet, possibly the greatest poet, uh, Russian language poet of the 20th century. That certainly was Roman Jakobsen. I just perhaps stress Roman Jakobsen, for those of you who don't know, uh, was really the founder of modern linguistics. Um, he's a Russian linguist and he was a schoolboy um, during the, the early years of um, Klebnikov's um, activity and he just idolized and almost worshipped um, Klebnikov and then Jakobsen became the founder of really modern linguistics. So the Prague School of Linguistics up until the 50s, 60s, 70s was the, absolutely the dominant school of linguistics worldwide and Jakobsen was the primary influence on Claude Lévi-Strauss and also the primary influence on Noam Chomsky. So if you think of Noam Chomsky and uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, I mean absolute enormous like, intellectual giants dominating you know, the, the second half of the 20th century in so many ways. Well Jakobsen, his influence was primarily Klebnikov and Jakobsen had said that Klebnikov isn't just the greatest poet in, in Russia, the, the greatest Russian-speaking poet of the 20th century, he's the greatest world poet. That was the opinion that Jakobsen had had of, of Klebnikov. So I've titled this talk um, Velimir Klebnikov, Prophet and Poet of the Russian Revolution. So starting with Prophet, <laughs> uh, in 1912 he was as as he had been for several years, burying himself in enormous lists of dates of historical events, going right back thousands of years, um, linking up various distant battles, the birth of Buddha, the birth of Marx, I mean, just all these dates, 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 and trying to find some mathematical pattern in all these dates. <laughs> <laughs> and he came up with the, the theory that there's a wavelength of history. And um, it reminds me a little bit of a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. What's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? Answer, 42. Um, Klebnikov said the wavelength of history is 317 years plus or minus 48. And in 1912, he worked it all out. And he thought, OK, um, a state will fall in 1917. Now, you had to be a little bit careful under Tsarist Russia when you say, you know, there's going to be a, a revolution, and it's a little bit cryptic, I suppose, a state will fall. But everyone, everyone around Klebnikov knew what he meant by that. He meant the Tsar will fall in 1917. Uh, and he got it right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> For, for Klebnikov, that was his revolution. The fall of the Tsar was his revolution. And he was proclaimed the king of time. Um, so, um, just to sort of recap a little bit, go back, it, back he was born in um, 1885. And the, 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 to, to mention that is a little bit important. He was, he, was, he was born on the western shores of the Caspian Sea in the only house in a settlement of tents because his dad was the administrator of, of the nomads um, of that, along that lake shore, Kalmyk nomads. And um, he, so he was, he was living in this one solid house among nomadic Buddhist um, camel herders and horse breeders. Um, and um, his house was apparently running through it were wild animals, hedgehogs, gerbils, all kinds of wild animals. Um, and because of his situation, his childhood, Klebnik always had um, a, a kind of nomadic sense. I mean, he 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 wrote that he would he would steal horses from neighbouring people's um, stables and ride them bareback. Um, but he also had a feeling of of, of um, uh, kind of claustrophobia if he was ever settled anywhere. So he had the, the view that really the human spirit is like one of no borders. You had to be able to move, 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 move. Um, but also his upbringing and his, his first six, six years of his life made him feel a sympathy towards the East. Um, so um, he had a, a kind of political longing for unity of the Eastern 
continents, um, kind of in opposition to um, Austria, um, Britain, um, and Western imperialism. Um, and um, I, I won't go into all the sort of details of his life, but he went to Kazan University um, later on, of course. His family moved several times before that happened. And um, at Kazan, and this I think is quite important, Kazan University was still haunted by the spirit of Nikolai Lobachevsky, the inventor of uh, non-Euclidean geometry. So this meant that geometry is not any longer spatial in the conventional sense, it's got different dimensions beyond just simple spatial dimensions. And this had a huge effect on Klebnikov. Um, and then he went he wasn't a very good student. He kept, you know, losing his notes and getting involved in politics and getting arrested and various things and not paying his fees, um, getting, you know, all that stuff. Um, but he, he, he decided he, he wanted to stay with the mathematics, but he switched over to natural sciences. And the natural sciences he studied um, were... Um, it was it was uh, kind of evolution. It was it was um, his father had been a, a, quite a well-known scientist, natural scientist, evolutionist, and ornithologist. So so um, the study of birds. Actually, Klebnikov's own first ever published essay was a, was a, an account of his um, bird watching. So he was studying birds, observing their migrations, and particularly uh, making notes about the bird songs. So he so he studied that, but also he studied geology. And I was just thinking when I was rem reminding myself of that, how do you he'd switch from maths to natural science, but, but particularly natural history and geology? And of course, if you're, if you're trying to find a connection between numbers and the whole of history of life on Earth, you're going to maybe come up with this idea that somehow there's a, there's a numerical way of ordering um, the whole history of life on Earth. And then sure enough, that's exactly what Klimnikov did when he started trying to work out the wavelength of history. Of course, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't I don't think, consider what he was doing as, as mathematics. It was more like the magic of numbers, more like numerology, a kind of aesthetic excitement about, about numbers and mathematics. Um, um, but it still was, had, a, had, a, had a huge effect on him, and it had a huge, huge effect on what happened um, shortly afterwards, because um, Klimnikov became the central figure in um, when he got to, um, to, to, to St. Petersburg, became the central figure in a, 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 a literary and cultural movement, which was called Budyetlanyi uh, Futurism. Um, and um, he was regarded as the kind of holy fool, I suppose, a genius the kind of mystic genius of futurism with his with his focus on on time and numbers but in particular he became he 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 started writing poems which are very strange um and his his poetry was um an attempt to almost treat human language as bird song or rather as like birds have their different songs and humans have our thing which is called speech and the songs themselves have notes and the notes are intrinsically meaningful and they had this sense that the sound the sounds of speech are intrinsically meaningful so they're not just given conventional meanings he hated the whole idea of social convention and sort of artificial constructed meanings overlaying the intrinsic meaningfulness of the sounds and he had the idea that if he reached down down to the core of the sounds of language, you would find something more than just local. First of all, his idea was that all the all the Slavic languages were connected, um, and if you buried deep enough into Russian, you'd find links to other Slavic languages, and you'd, you'd get back to the origin of all the Slavic languages. But if you buried even deeper, you would you would get uh, uh, eventually to um, human. You'd get to the root of all the all the world's languages, and you'd find a universal tongue. And so, this idea of a universal tongue, universal language, which was in his poetry, became part of the futurist um, vision. Um, so, uh, the way I think of it is that Klebnikov's poems, certainly some of them, 
So almost when you hear them, and correct, we've got two Russians in the, in the room here, you hear them and you're, you're kind of not quite sure if it's language. Is this bird song? Is this some kind of strange way of making sounds from some, some maybe pre-human species, but nearly human, but not quite? And you feel that you're on the verge of language, but perhaps not quite there. Um, and that became linked to the idea that humanity itself in this build-up to the Russian Revolution was on the verge of finding its voice. We are just about to find our voice as a species, just about to speak. When we do speak it will be in a universal tongue and the way he, he conceptualized it was going back to his studies of birds. He, f he had the idea that humanity as a whole were just beginning to flex our wings and possibly we'll soon be flying as well as speaking to each other uh, in, this, in this deep, you know, universal uh, tongue. So he became the genius of f Russian futurism, which was a completely anarchic, iconoclastic, wild um, movement. And again, when I when I'm looking back on the various things <laughs> I've done at various times with my various attempts at street theatre and face painting and agitprop of different sorts, and I've done a lot over the years, um, nothing I've done has been quite as unhinged, I don't think, as what the um, futurist <laughs> <laughs> futurist did. <laughs> the the future, I mean, uh, one of the futurists is probably the most famous because Stalin, uh, Joseph Stalin, after after Mayakovsky's. Um, suicide um, sort of changed his view. Stalin had previously, as all this, the, the, the socialism in one country, um, you know, um, communist, had all decided that the futurism is formalism, and formalism is deeply bourgeois and reactionary. Um, and so Klebnikov wasn't at all popular, and still isn't with with sort of traditional communist party orthodoxy. But but after after Mayakovsky's suicide, Stalin decided, okay, Mayakovsky is the greatest of all Soviet poets <laughs> and it is a, to, um, to ignore Mayakovsky is a crime. <laughs> Um, okay, that's, that's Stalin's verdict. But, but of course, um, Mayakovsky was one of um, Klebnikov's very close friends in 1910, um, 11, 12, along with many of the other futures. And Mayakovsky would, would um, uh, swagger around with a, with, a top, with a top hat, his face painted with numbers and letters, in brilliant psychedelic colours, and he'd wear a bright, bright, bright yellow uh, coat. And they would, they would just strut about, annoying the police, annoying the public. Um, I mean, their idea of a piano concert was to have a, a room with a, and make sure the grand piano was t hooked up to the ceiling on ropes and then you cut the ropes and the whole cr piano crashes to the floor and you appreciate the sound it makes. <laughs> <laughs> that was their idea of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a concert. So you can, I, I'm, all I'm saying is the, 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 best, the best sort of, you know, I mean, yes they were certainly communists but they were much more anarcho-communist than any kind of straight, you know, Lenin, Trotsky um, type of communist. But when, but when the revolution broke out in February 1917, it was above all the futurists who rallied to the revolution. And the futurists, they became the artistic expression of the Russian revolution. Absolutely, for them, this was their revolution in every, sing in every sense. And Klebnikov um, was, was regarded by the other futurists as rather, I mean, one of the points to make about Klebnikov, I mentioned earlier that his, his nomadic leanings, he hated being in any one place at, and, st and staying there. Um, during the, 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 Russia, the Civil War, which followed the Russian Revolution, um, he basically lived in railway trains. So he was just in a railway train, traveling around, keeping warm, um, and he had a pillowcase to lay his head on, and his pillowcase was stuffed with crumpled balls of paper. And these crumpled balls of paper were his poems, but of course if you crumple them up, they're much more comfy to lie on. And he'd leave these pillowcases lying around sometimes, and his friends would say, rush after him and try to, you know, fill him in, fill him in, you know. And it's really important, we'd, get, we'd, we'd recover these crumpled up pieces of paper. And he never really saw the, quite the point of it. Um, he never he never finished anything. He thought finishing anything was, was wrong in principle. Um, it, was, it was very, very, sh very, very shy. Um, uh, and when, sometimes they, his friends forced him to give a poetry reading. And he would take up from his pocket one of these crumpled bits of paper with little spidery writing. And he'd read out a few lines and, he'd, and, he'd, and, he'd, and then he'd say, and so on. <laughs> 
and his friends said, no, 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 we want to hear it, you know, because he just thought it was, you know, he, 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 the whole point of him was the process of writing and, and to finish anything was kind of wrong. And, what, and perhaps I should mention another point. He um, had, a, he had a, uh, um, he had an insight into the what we would now call, I think, the discrete combinatorial or the digital characteristics of human language. So human language is kind of strange compared with animal languages because the sounds we make are not graded. The sounds don't, s don't grade into each other. We have vowels and consonants which are categorically distinct. So when we, s when we utter a word, there's kind of no continuity between say the B uh, and the A which follows it. There's a, there's a, there's a cut-off, one, you know, there's a categorical distinction between the two, between the, two, you know, the, 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 the initial consonant and the subsequent vowel. And he, he big that principle of no continuity, no connection, no sort of grey in-between sounds between the different um, di discrete sounds, he picked that up into a general principle for everything he wrote. So he, at one stage he was writing to a friend, I'm, I'm working on a very ambitious project. It was a long um, play, a kind of what he called a super saga. And he said, no chapter will have the sl any connection whatsoever with the next. No. So all the chapters are completely cut off from the, the, the previous chapters and the, uh, in meaning, in style, in tone, everything else. You just get a slab of this, another slab of that, another slab of that. So he's, he's bigging up the principle of language into a kind of principled, you know, uh, he, he's, tr he's transforming the scale of that principle uh, onto a level which other people might have thought inappropriate, but he was making his basic point. He was, in, in, he was interested in the kind of the atomic structure of language. Um, um, and of course, above all, I should say, and we're going to get to this in a minute, the idea of, of Klebnikov uh, was that um, the forms of language need to have their own voice. Um, so don't, don't, don't have a, a message and then employ your form as an instrument to get across your content or your message, the form itself needs to speak with its own voice. Now that of course was a, a principle which was um, taken up. I'm not saying Klebnikov was necessarily the, the initiator of that idea, but the futurists, and the, they were often called Cuba futurists, so, so Cubism for example was very much that idea that you need, and, but, but really modernism in general in, in the arts was the idea that um, the, the paintbrush in painting must speak for itself. Its actual, you know, the actual bristles must make their mark and, and speak, and the actual smell of the paint and the colour of the paint must speak. Don't just subordinate all that to some external uh, meaning or message. And of course, that's the whole point about formalism. So the idea was that you, you don't, you, because you're because you're in a revolutionary situation, you can't you can't be, you can't start from an existing content, and certainly you don't you don't start from the idea of reality. Art is not meant to be, according to the futurists, uh, a, a, a reflection. Art must, isn't a mirror um, of reality. It's, uh, in, in Mayakovsky's words, it's a hammer with which to shape the future. Um, okay, so um, that's my intro. And then these are um, different pictures of um, uh, Klebnikov. For those of you who, don't, who um, I mean, this is that this one here. He's in he's in he's in uniform there. He's a, he's been recruited into the army, and perhaps I'll read I'll read that out. This is this is his um, poem "Bad News," April the eighteenth, April the eighth, nineteen sixteen. Uh, it's response to being um, conscripted. Me too. You mean I'll have to grab a gun? a dumb thing heavier than handwriting and go marching down some highway beating out 365 times 317 regular heartbeats a day uh, he'd calculated the number of heartbeats it would take to walk down the street from his you know his um, numbers um, knock my head to fragments and forget the government of 22 year olds that attacks the madness of elder statesmen he he, he felt that his own generation the futures really were the future government and these elder statesmen were, were murderers i mean they must be murderers because there they are you know they're just causing these mass you know torrents of blood in the in the trenches um so um knock my head to fragments and forget the government of 22 year olds that attacks the madness of elder statesmen me who wrote all these poems their lines a ladder to the silver moon 
So he was pretty fed up. He's looking a bit miserable, isn't he, in that uh, picture there? Um, and uh, okay, that's his. That's when he was um, 11, in the far locked corner, and that's his his dad on the right there. That's Chemnikov, Vilimir, um, standing up, and his mum. Um, okay, now I wanted to. Um, put the whole um, um, movement, Klebnikov's movement and, and futurism in, uh, in a kind of wider context in terms of, of the history of Western thought. Um, I'll try and be brief. Um, so, um, some of you will know the, the, the sociologist Max Weber and his book um, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Uh, an amazing, wonderful book. Um, and um, what Weber does in that work is to show how um, Calvinism in particular um, set about um, disenchanting the world, desacralizing the world. So um, even under even under Christianity, the early forms of Christianity, despite all the emphasis on Jesus and his blood, you still had um, sacred wells, you still have had um, sacred groves, you still have had forests, you still have had rivers which had about them something of the sacred. Um, and Calvinism went systematically ar about desacralizing. Nothing is sacred apart from belief in Jesus. Um, and that that notion was all, was paralleled in science um, by, among others, René Descartes, often considered the, the father of science. And the idea here was that um, to do science, you have to study nature, but don't be seduced by nature. Don't let nature enchant you, seduce you. Don't let the stars that get you lost in wonderment. Don't let the trees just sing to you. Make sure that you are, if you're studying humans, and this is medicine, it's best to study a corpse, because it's dead, and you cut it up, and you can understand how a human being works. But don't be, don't, 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 don't let the, the birds, the trees, the people speak in their own voice to you, because that's not science. So this, this notion that you, that you must deny nature her voice or, or, or deny the, the, the inhabitants of the planet their own voice and, have, and instead have your own will which you impose on nature, there was a, 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 there was a parallel between that and Calvinism. In fact, in many ways, one of the reasons why Cartesian rationalism became successful was because um, the different versions of Catholicism and Protestantism found themselves comfortable with the idea that um, there's nothing sacred in the world apart from faith, um, and in particular faith in the redemptive power of um, the blood of Jesus. So having said all that, you can see where I'm getting to. Because Klebnikov wanted to re-enchant the world and was most emphatic that the trees, the mountains, the lakes, the waterholes need their own voice. Uh, and he in fact regarded his poetry as that voice. Give a voice to the world. And partly, and I mentioned earlier on his kind of pan-Slavic and Asiatic um, sympathies coming from his childhood on, on the border between East and West, partly he was, he was thinking in terms of Slavic language speakers finding their voice. At one time he said, I'm the first Russian to speak Russian. <laughs> by which he meant that the Russian language had become so Frenchified and Latinized and Germanicified and all that rest of it that somehow the actual real Russian wasn't being spoken any longer. And so he linked the idea that he was finding a voice for peasant Russians, um, n you know, non-urban Russians, di Russians from different regions, giving and, and celebrating the fact that their, their language is, is kind of authentic. He linked that to the idea of giving um, the nature that people inhabited um, a voice. Um, for the first time. So re-enchant the world. Um, and um, perhaps um, Klebnikov's most famous poem um, it, it reflects the fact that he's, he regarded himself as, um, as a magician, as a shaman, um, and his poetry as incantation, enchantment. And his most famous poem is, um, of course, Incantation by Laughter. 
Um, and again, um, for Calvinists, I don't think laughter is hugely celebrated. I don't have it too many records of René Descartes laughing. Um, I mean, and, 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 and I, I should perhaps just briefly mention, I can't go into it of course, but Michael Bakhtin came out of the same school, rather in many ways a little bit different, but I mean certainly Bakhtin was very much um, in favour of popular culture, Can't obviously the, you know, the author of Rabelais and his world. Um, but um, uh, celebrating the, 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 re the redemptive power and wisdom of, of communal laughter. Nothing's more levelling than laughter. Um, and, and nothing's better at, 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 cre cre at creating sanity than, than the, the ability to laugh at the pomposity of kings and princes and bishops. Laughter is the, is the best um, possible antidote. So, so um, Can somebody, Veronica, would you read that out for me, please? Can you read that out? Is it a bit too much to ask you? I mean, I can read it myself, but I'm not sure my Russian would be very good. In Russian? Sorry? In Russian. Well, in Russian, of course, yes, yes. Uh, was that good everyone <laughs> <laughs> so um here is a very good um, uh, translation by it, I think, by Paul Schmidt. So, Hlaha uh, Huthlofen Lufflings, Hlaha Huthlofen Lufflings, who lochen with Lafe, who Hrachilin Luchli, Hlaha Huthlofen Hluli, Hlaha Hlufish Lufflings Lafe Hlofen Otofli, Hlofen, Lofen, Hlo, 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 Luifikin, Luifikin, Hlofenungun, Hlofenungun, Hla, Hluthlon, Lufflings, Hlaha Luthlofen Lufflings. So, I think, I think that's a fantastic translation. I don't know if you do, um, but I was told that Russian, I know you didn't laugh because I was, I, I was you know, asking you to read it all, but I, I, I've been told that Russians, when they read the, the, the Russian version, find it actually quite hard to, to read that aloud without, without actually laughing. It, sa it sounds like laughter. And this, this by the way, this is, t this is Tatlin's, um, uh, we're going to come on to Tatlin in a moment. Vladimir Tatlin w um, was one of the close, very closest friends of, of Klebnikov. And this is um, um, after Klebnikov died, um, uh, one of his plays was performed, um, and, and um, Tatlin. Uh, the, the, the characters in the planes were sort of abstractions. One of the characters was just called laughter. And here we have this is, this is Tatlin's um, image of, of, of laughter. So, and this is another poem, and, and um, this is just to um, make the point I was making earlier. These are, these are Kalmyk um, horses, and the, the, this, this particular um, Mongolian tribe, probably come from Mongolia originally, um, Buddhist um, nomad people, they were the breeders of the, of the best horses that the Russians had. So the, the Tsar would purchase these horses um, and the, the Kalmyks would um, herd their horses, maybe 6,000 horses would be herded up towards Moscow um, uh, to, be, to be used in the, in the cavalry. And um, so, um, uh, Tsar, do you want to read this one? Can you read that? Is your, your no, 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 loud and clear. <coughs> Slowly. So, when horses die, they breathe. When grasses die, they wither. When suns die, they go out. When people die, they sing songs. I have a feeling he must have been possibly thinking of Schubert, but I mean, I, I suppose many other people who've, um, who've, who've written um, you know, swan songs in their poetry. Um, and then here on the, on the left here, he's, he, in, he says, I have discovered the fundamental laws of time, and I believe that now it will be as easy to predict events as to count to three. If people don't want to learn my art of predicting the future, I shall teach it to horses. <laughs> he had a very high opinion of, uh, of horses. Um, <laughs> 
uh, as you would do if you've if you've ridden unbridled horses um, from other people's stables, as he puts anarchist it. In his horses. Uh, probably anarchist horses. That's right. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. And uh, unbridled horses are definitely anarchist horses. Yes, they haven't been bridled exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is just um, my. Um, I have to be fairly quick about this, but um, as a lot of you know, I've written this book on um, Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, decoding Chomsky. Um, and this is just to kind of emphasise the importance of, of Klebnikov historically and the, the scandal that he's been so, so widely ignored in the West. Um, so, um, um, Klebnikov, uh, because of his view of language, he wasn't interested in in boundaries between languages, the difference between one type of language, um, you know, spoken in one region and another. His his real interest was getting much much deeper to the universal underpinnings um, of of language as such, um, and that was kind of new for linguistics um, in that time. And it was certainly Roman Jakobson's view. Roman Jakobson was interested in the fundamental um, structure of S linguistic sounds as such, and he, he worked out this theory called the, the theory of distinctive features, where all the world's languages um, are constructed out of a, of a limited repertoire of what he called distinctive features, which are on off switches. And um, Jakobson um, always insisted that he had he got that idea from Klebnikov. Klebnikov didn't kind of write down the idea, but he expressed the idea in practice in the way he wrote his poetry. And of course that is exactly, um, well, Jakobson, for those of you who don't know, Raman Jakobson's theory of distinctive features, which is this idea that at the root of um, language sounds are these off-on switches, like voicing on, voicing off, nasalization switched on, nasalization switched off, so that your vocal apparatus is almost like a digital computer with all these on-off switches. That idea was taken up by Claude Lévi-Strauss. And Claude Lévi-Strauss then extended it from phonology, the study of, of speech sounds, to the study of, of kinship, uh, ritual, and mythology. And, where, and whereas, whereas Klemnikov was saying, at root, we have one language only, all of humanity, um, of course, um, Lévi-Strauss, getting those ideas via Jakobson, um, said that, uh, I mean, and, and of course this was, this was revolutionary. I mean, anthropology before that had been largely the efforts of colonialists to study um, tribes, local tribes with a boundary, um, the Babemba do this, the, you know, the, another group do this, you've got to be able to work out what, how these tribes organize their kinship systems, their rituals they miss, but you have these monologues of bounded tribes and then you, you have another one, you have another one, you have the, Wol the Wolgeo Islanders do this, the Aranda do, do something different, whatever. Whereas um, Levi Strauss, influenced by Jakobson, in turn therefore influenced uh, ultimately by Klebnikov, was interested in the idea of the universal structures, the elementary structures of kinship um, and ritual and mythology. And as I've, in other lectures I've given here, um, uh, Levi Strauss came up with the idea, uh, the finding I would argue, uh, one myth only. All the world's magical myths and fairy tales are at the end of the day, in terms of their grammar, their underlying syntax, they're one myth only. The whole of humanity is, is enveloped with a web of mythology and it's like one voice. Um, and then and then Noam Chomsky, uh, uh, I don't think in anywhere near so successfully, but, uh, but again Chomsky was directly influenced more than by anyone else really, by Jakobson. He claims to have been influenced by Plato more, but that's absolute, I think it's complete rubbish, he wasn't influenced by Plato uh, or, or Descartes. It was Jakobson that was the main influence, but Chomsky's idea of universal grammar is another version of this, of this no borders idea. So what's attractive about, about structuralism, about Chomsky's linguistics, what's attractive about Levi-Strauss's structuralism are all these things. The idea that um, there are no borders, that language like Birdsong is part of nature, that you do natural science, that meanings are internal, inseparable from form, you don't just arbitrarily assign meanings to things, you have just one language, there's something mathematical about linguistics, 
um, a, a p poets and artists are engineers of the soul. I'm, I mean, Noam Chomsky wouldn't put it that way, <laughs> um, but this is the future's way of thinking about it. And there was certainly Klebnikov's idea, but the idea that when you're dealing with language, you're dealing with, yes, I mean, Chomsky does talk about the soul quite a lot, actually. He, he, he actually says the modern idea of, of, of um, the language faculty, the distinctly, uniquely human language faculty, is a, uh, uh, Chomsky says this, it's, a, it's a, like a, 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 um, a, a translating into modern scientific terminology the ancient idea of the soul. Um, the search for hidden structures, you don't, you don't look at things that on the surface, you, you bury deeper. Um, every child is a genius from birth, that was certainly Klebnikov's idea and it's definitely um, it, it, um, Chomsky as well. So again, okay, school teachers, you don't, you don't need school teachers because every child has already got the language instinct or the language um, basic knowledge of the, what, language, what a human language is. <laughs> Um, hostility to the idea of learning, habit, convention. The Russian word for all those things is buit. So buit in Russian, as I understand it, it means, uh, it's hard to translate, but it kind of means boredom. Boring, same old, same old, every day the same damn thing, habit, um, buit. And um, Klebnikov, that, for the futures, that was the worst, that was the enemy. And of course buit, habit, is the the weight of the past on the present, just conventional habit. They, uh, they hated that more than anything else. And, and because conventional language um, is ref reflecting the pressure from the past, the logical conclusion must be that creative language must be reflected from, must be um, bending to a wind from the opposite direction. And according to Klebnikov, the wind of creativity comes from the future. So any poet has to be a futurist. You're, you're, you're already anticipating the future in your poetic um, creativity. And then the idea that science is the true counterculture. Um, Klebnikov, I had a kind of magical view of science. Um, it would be very, it would be stretching things quite a lot to think of Klebnikov as a scientist. Um, but he, he, he appreciated the, 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 the empowerment of science, the magic of science, the liberation of science, the, 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 the universalism of science. Like he, he, he argued that science is the one universal language which we have, and there needs to be an international of science. The, the scientists, we all, we can all be scientists in different, to different degrees and, and ways, but, we, but there's something in, intrinsically internationalist about science and therefore uh, revolutionary. So those things are shared by Klebnikov, Jakobson, Levi Strauss and Chomsky. I think, I claim, I'm not saying, you know, obviously there's huge differences. I mean Chomsky wasn't the slightest bit interested in magic or poetry or singing or anything <laughs> of those things. Uh, I want to make it very clear. Um, but there's, but, but there's th those, those aspects are shared um, um, between all those people. And this is, um, this is, my, this is my ponderings about myself. Um, well, I say, I, some of you may, may recognize this strange character here saying eat the bankers, <laughs> the professor behind the riots. Um, but when I'm thinking about all these, I won't go into, uh, this isn't about me, it's about Klebnikov, but, <laughs> but I mean, um, uh, uh, reclaim the stars. I mean, I was involved in an, an attempt, having come back from Hadza country with the Hadza, they, they, they need, you know, they need to, they need to see the Milky Way. They need to prevent light pollution. Dark moon is the time for ritual. And it just, I remember soon after coming back, being shown, um, by actually somebody who was making a big lunar clock, um, the pictures of the, the night sky in the west from a satellite and it's the whole of the northern hemisphere is just like burning, you just see it's just light pollution, just you know, huge amount of light and it's, it's static, it's just, it's not periodic, it doesn't wax and wane with the moon, it's just the lights are on, 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 on continuously uh, every night, you know, summer and winter um, and it does fairly clear when you see an image like that, I haven't shown it here, this is like symptomatic of the fact that we're, we're probably burning up the only planet we've got. So reclaim the stars, the government of the dead, I uh, can go into that a bit. <laughs> Klebnikov, Klebnikov uh, he, he once explained, it, actually in his autobiography, he said, um, I've made a contract of, I've made a, a marital contract with death. And in, that, and in that sense, I'm, I'm married. 
and there's a picture of him with a skull right next to him and you, he had this feeling of sort of intimacy and closeness to death I mean that was without any doubt a result of being uh, conscripted into the um, army in World War One um, and he felt a very strong feeling that the dead ought to be allowed a voice uh, in determining the future of politics in, in, in Europe. There should be no more war, but the dead need to be able to say that, so give the dead back their voice. Um, a kind of government of the dead idea, let there be darkness, world congress of indigenous nations, and then I just put down here a few things we've had lectures on here in, in RAG, on earth as it is in heaven, we had that lecture last week didn't we? So Klimnikov, he, he, he kept saying that, you, that the, um, this comes partly from his feeling for, for birds, that birds fly and they don't, they have wings, so they certainly don't care about fences and borders, they, 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 you know, they, they migrate across those man-made borders but they do respect borders in time you have the first swallow in spring you have these seasonal migrations of the birds um, but but more than that the idea of let there be darkness was like let's see the stars um, and Klebnikov had the idea that the stars need to be in some sense empowered to um, govern planet Earth. I mean, he had the idea that we are an Earth-Moon-Sun system, one of the objects in the, in the wider universe, and the stars have a role to play in keeping us um, oriented. Um, so, okay, archaeoastronomy, Marisa, the origin of all magic was menstruation. I'm not saying Klebnikov didn't, didn't mention the word menstruation, but he was always on about the moon and the relationship between Earth, the moon and the sun and the need for borders in time as opposed to borders in space. Um, so he said that everything, everything eventually boils down to this link between the Earth, the moon and the sun and those periodicities need to be restored and given and, and made, made, you know, made Made, made powerful um, once again. Camilla Greenwich, Moon Time. Um, I mean, I, I could go on about, you know, the, 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 I mean, the, the, there's no doubt Klebnikov had a particular affection for um, the Moon. Um, Mourner's Communism in Motion. Klebnikov never had the idea of a sort of static form of th something called communism. He always had the idea that you don't finish things, you keep beginning them, um, and everything's in flux and motion and movement, uh, particularly in relationship to the Earth Moon Sun system. And then Government by Laughter. And we've heard a lot of from Jerome and Ingrid about the, the, the role of laughter among, um, among hunters and gatherers, how laughter is the main um, leveling device. So these are all just different ideas which um, seem to have had a. And I was, what I'm trying to say there is that um, in re preparing this talk, it was just coming to me. I said, what, is, what idea have I had in my life that wasn't anticipated by Klebnikov? And it, I just realized that the, the influence of Klebnikov on my thinking was much deeper than I've really been uh, prepared to admit. I have to like, sometimes like to think of myself as not, as not unhinged, as very s r rigorously Marxist, Leninist, Trotskyist. Um, but when I, when I look at those things, various things I've done, I think actually no, Klebnik have had just as much influence on me as, as Marx or Engels or Lenin or Trotsky. Um, and maybe more in some ways, because I mean, the point about Klebnikov was he had a had a very, very rich, uh, fleshed out, concrete vision of the revolutionary future of our species. Um, um, so, okay, um, uh, what have I got up that up there for? Okay, so this is um, these are. <laughs> Uh, that's a picture of Nikolai Lobachevsky, the inventor of, of uh, non-Euclidean geometry, who, who died about 40 or 50 years before Klebnikov went to Kazan University, but he was the towering figure at, at um, Kazan University, and it was because of Lobachevsky that Klebnikov decided to study mathematics. This, of course, is another Russian scientist, um, Mendeleev. This is the periodic table of the, of the elements. The, the, all the different elements, they look all different, but underneath them are these numbers, um, uh, 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 atomic numbers of course and, you, and, and according to the number you get the, you know how heavy they are and all the different chemical properties now of course <laughs> of course Einstein this is Einstein was not a Russian um, but um, but the young Einstein was already known about in in Russia from about I think about 1912 and of course it wasn't I'm not at all saying that anyone in Russia at that stage understood uh, you know, anything that Einstein the real genius was actually saying but the popular versions of Einstein were, were coming through and of course the popular image of Einstein is that um, time is really space 
Uh, in space, you can move backwards and forwards. You know, it's all kind of simultaneous in some sense. Uh, and you can you can just as well go this way as that way. So why not wind the clock back and bring all the dead back to life again um, and travel around? I mean, this is <laughs> these were ideas which are completely. Um, um, I mean, the, the word is. I mean, I suppose unhinged. Um, not at all an accurate reflection of what Einstein was really thinking. But there are, but um, I'm just making the point that um, Klimnik have had a had a reverential feeling for natural science um, and, and, and it, okay, let's say a little bit more. This was revolution. There was a, a vision of, of impending revolution. I'm talking about 1908, 1910, 1912, 1913, impending revolution. And what do you do in a revolution? You overthrow the system. You overthrow, you know, the, you, you disobey the rules. Oh, these, these rules are made up by criminals, you know, that organized the World War I. And while you're about it, if you're breaking all the rules, why not break some other rules? Why not, you know, what, what is this foolish rule about the fact you're going to have to die and stay dead? Why not, you know, break that one as well? And and then and then Kevin had the idea that maybe you should. He didn't. Like, he didn't like the sun. He thought that. I mean, he loved the moon, but he wasn't at all happy about the sun. And um, he his, his the first opera that he 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 wrote was performed, I think, in 1913 in uh, St. Petersburg, and it was called Victory Over the Sun. And in this opera, I mean, again, it was it was absolutely scandalous. It was they, they, they had the they had futures music, um, futures um, stage sets produced by by Tatlin, and and the, the opera was a story about how people were, were, were fed up with the sun and decided to stab it. So they attacked the sun and stabbed it and tried to kill it. And it was a, it was a completely absurd story. Um, and um, and in the when it was when it was performed, there were cat calls, boos, hisses. The people at the back were throwing apple cores at the at the, at the, at the actors on the stage. And the future says they loved it. That was the whole point to have you know. And and the best thing of all would be to have the whole theatre close down and the police take over and all that stuff and cause a real rumpus. Um, so I'm, all I'm saying is, <laughs> obviously Einstein wasn't necessarily recommending that, but he was giving them the <laughs> giving them the feeling that some things you think of as absolutely inviolable laws of nature and laws of physics um, aren't, that you can sort of defy them and break them, um, and particularly the laws governing, um, governing time. So that's a lovely um, painting of Klebnikov by Mikhail Larionov. And th now the next few slides, I think, if I've got my slides in the right order. So this is um, Sergei Diaghilev, Ballet Russe, uh, 1912. Uh, how much time have I got? Oh my God, I've only got 10 minutes. My God, okay, all right, Mark. Okay, so I mean, what people need to, I mean, uh, we, I think we all know this, don't we? Russia was where everything was happening. I mean, Europe was kind of boring. France, Spain, Britain especially, even Germany. Compared with what was happening in Russia in this, what's called the Silver Age, all the most exciting art, culture, music. Uh, it wasn't just the, the radical politics of Lenin and Trotsky and the other the Bolsheviks. It was also in the arts. There was this, everything was more revolutionary in Russia than anywhere else. So although you had Cubism, somehow Cubism went further in Russia. Um, now, um, actually, this was a this wasn't this kind of thing wasn't necessarily the kind of art that the futurists like. They, they regarded this as a bit too um, bit too sophisticated, a bit too bourgeois. Um, but I'm just giving you a sort of background of the of the kind of environment, cultural environment. Um, and this is um, Meyerholt, much much closer to the futurists. The, um, um, Stravinsky, Prokofiev, I mean, just to mention these people, these, I mean, I, I just absolutely love Prokofiev's music. Um, but Prokofiev was, came from the same period as Klebnikov, Stravinsky the same. Um, this is Natalia Goncharova, the cyclist. So can you see what's happening? These, the, we're, 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 we've got a cyclist, of course, but we're looking at the at the forms of movement, this movement, this movement, this kind of digital step-by-step, -step, obviously um, inspired by um, the development of cinematography. Um, but notice the big letters as well. The, the lettering is itself becoming sort of visible and seen. Um, uh, this is Lyubov Popova, portrait of a philosopher. Quite a few um, uh, female um, futurist artists. 
and um, maybe my favourite, Kazimir Malievich, this is uh, the woodcutter, 1912, again you can just see um, humans, shapes were made of cubes, um, you know, cylinders, rectangles and stuff, why not show them, you know, why not let, the, let those forms sort of speak in their own voice, why just sub subordinate the forms to the final product of the, of the image we're trying to um, get across. Uh, the knife grinder. Oh, what an amazing, wonderful um, painting. Um, the future is for Vladimir Mayakovsky with his um, top hat. Um, Mayakovsky, of course, with his. This is a bit later. This was. This was after the revolution. Um, he 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 was responsible for a large proportion of the Soviet um, young Soviet republics um, um, posters and propaganda. Um, absolutely in line with what Klebnikov would have wanted. Art, art is magic. Art changes the world. It does not. It's not socialist realism. It doesn't reflect any reality. It makes reality itself. So I'll reveal to you in words. This is Mayakovsky. As simple as mooing your new souls that hum like arc lights. So this combination of the future with the future of electricity and uh, electric lighting and uh, steam engines and things uh, a familiar characteristic of the futurist I could I could explain a little bit more about the way in which the Russian futurists were different from the Italian futurists the Italian futurists celebrated machines in a much more unsophisticated way uh, they celebrated aeroplanes um, tanks machine guns war you know the, on the onset of all this iron and steel m m mechanics um, Klimnikov had an exact opposite view really. His idea was that the new technology was taking us back. Um, the, the, the future was like a return on a higher level to the past. Uh, the, 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 new, the new technology he really celebrated was kind of restoring um, the power of the voice um, and um, the, 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 the means of communication of, of um, pre-class um, tribal uh, cultures. Uh, art is not a mirror to reflect the world, but a hammer with which to shape it, which is a very good slogan. <laughs> <laughs> Bolshevik agitprop train. Um, it's obviously from a film set, um, Warren Beatty, The Reds. I'm afraid it's not a real photograph, but it still, it still inspires me, and it was real. So uh, Lisitsky beat the whites with a red wedge, Lenin, have you noticed this version of it, is, Trotsky has not been airbrushed out, nearly all the pictures of this have had, there's all been air, Trotsky doesn't exist any longer, he's been airbrushed out, but here's the actual photograph, Lenin and Trotsky of course led the revolution together, and if anybody it was Trotsky who was the actual organiser of the insurrection, people need to know that, and the founder of the Red Army. Um, but here we have um, these, these, these agitprop trains, this one's called the printer. They in these trains they had printing presses, sometimes they had um, little theatres, um, and they were beautiful. And we've, it's a shame we didn't have colour for it, but this, this would have been psychedelic, absolutely wonderful, brilliant um, colours. Any left? I don't think there's any left. I don't know. I don't, I've never seen a, 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 a real uh, carriage, uh, and maybe I may be wrong, but I haven't seen. It. Does anyone know if there's any left? I'd, I've never seen a, even a colour picture of, of one of these, but maybe there, maybe there might, might be some. Now here. Teatr Naroda, the People's Theatre, um, is a cinema theatre, and the, the, the people are, are piling in to, to watch a, a propaganda, an agit prop propaganda film. Kroznayet tot pobjedayet. Whoever knows, will, it's like information is power. If you know stuff, you'll, you'll win. Um, now notice here with his broom, he's sweeping away all the Tsarist rubbish, from his, like, you know, off you go into the dustbin of history. <coughs> Uh, so they had trains, they had horse carts, um, and they had ships. This is a steamboat, this is the Red Star steam, steamboat um, going down um, the Volga. It's now at Saratov in 1920. And in this, in this steamboat would have been, of course, um, all kinds of um, theatres and printing presses and prop, you know, sources of propaganda to win the, um, to win the Civil War. 
So this is victory over the sun um, in St. Petersburg 1913 and it was in this opera in 1913 written by Klebnikov that this famous black square appeared for the first time. So most often if you go to the Tate Modern you'll see um, or, or an exhibition of um, um, uh, Melievich's art you'll ha have the idea that the black square which is this thing um, uh, was painted in 1915. Um, but actually it came from Klimnikov's opera, um, Victory Over the Sun. And it's like, uh, <laughs> it's um, let there be darkness. Um, let's start from zero. Let's start from nothing at all and build up from there. Um, uh, as well as meaning, let's um, blot out the sun and the, and the and light pollution and let's, let's see the stars. So this is um, the monument to the Third International. And it was built really to Klebnikov's specifications. I mean, I, I've, I've written about that in my book. There's not much doubt about it. This was the way to get to the stars. This was the way to connect up this world with the other world. On earth as it is in heaven. Have, this is the transmission connection. And so, um, these are, these are, this, this is the real model. Obviously the thing was never built. Um, perhaps I should just say a little bit about it for those of you who haven't read my book or haven't, don't know about this. This was going to be built across the Neva at the point where the, the, the proletariat from the Vyborg side, the industrial um, heartland, cross the river, cross the Neva to storm uh, the Winter Palace. So this huge um, spiral double helix monument was to have one leg on one side of the neighbor, one side on the other, and the idea was that endlessly you'd reenact that mythic moment of the crossing of the neighbor to storm the Winter Palace and, um, and win the revolution. And it was going to be a hundred meters higher than the Eiffel Tower, 400 meters up into the sky. And you see pictures of it when it's like, you know, the way it was meant to be. It's like a, it's like tunneling up from under the ground, spiraling up not here, and it's at 23.5 degrees. Why is it tilted at 23.5 degrees? It's aiming at the pole star. So Tatlin himself, the very close friend of Klebnikov, had been a sailor. And when you're lost at sea, you've got to get your bearings. You've got to know the still point in the changing you know, sky, and that's that star. And Klemnikov was maybe too well aware of the feeling of being lost, you know, the, the First World War, all the huge upheavals, how do you find your pole star, how do you find a bearing? Well, you've got to find that pole star, and the whole of humanity has got to find it, and the way for the whole of humanity to find it is to make that connection. So you, you, the, 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 this monument was to be the place where the World Congress of Soviets met. Um, and at the base of it was um, a cube, and this cube was to spin round once a year, and that's where they had conferences. And then above it was a pyramid, and that spin round like the moon once a month. And that was for all sorts of other artistic and, and, and agitprop, you know, comings and goings. So the whole, the whole thing was to be seething with people, Soviet delegates from all over planet Earth, all meeting and, and you know, hatching their revolutionary plans. And the top was this cylinder, which went round once a day, and in the top was the radio beaming out messages to all of humanity. So you had a cylinder, um, a pyramid, and a cube. Now those are all basic forms, but where's the sphere? There's no sphere that seems to be missing until you realize actually the whole planet Earth was the sphere. That was enough. So this whole thing was designed to connect planet Earth in a revolutionary way. Actually there were seven, seven steps as well. There's an, there's an, there's an ancient um, uh, t biblical tradition, an Old Testament tradition about the seven steps to heaven. So they were actually storming heaven. The ideas were going to reach heaven and this is the way to do it. Um, uh, so, um, I don't have to s stress to you that the poor um, Bolsheviks, with the resources they had, and was faced with, a, uh, you know, England and various other countries, you know, financing the whites to crush the revolution, they didn't have the resources to build this extraordinary thing. But that's not something like what it would have looked like. Um, <laughs> 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 All that. Yeah. 
earth, moon, sun, reclaim the stars, reach, let's reach heaven, and let's, let's, let's keep things spiraling, moving, let's, let's, you know, communism in motion, let's keep the, you know, keep the spirals turning. And um, it wasn't built, but in Moscow, uh, the Shukov radio tower was being built in 1920 to 22, um, uh, which sort of wasn't quite the same thing, um, but it inspired Klebnikov. And he, had, he wrote this amazing piece just before he died. He died in 1922, and just a few weeks before he died, he wrote The Radio of the Future. From this point in planet Earth, every day, like the flight of birds in springtime, back to those birds again, a flock of news departs, news from the life of the spirit. In this stream of light and birds, the spirit will prevail over force, good counsel over threats. Amazing silver bells mixed with whistling surge down from above. Are these perhaps the voices of heaven? Spirits flying low over the farmhouse roof? No! The Mussorgsky of the future is giving a coast-to-coast -coast concert of his work, using the radio apparatus to create a vast concert hall stretching from the Vladivostok to the Baltic beneath the blue dome of the heavens. The activities of artists who work with a pen and brush, the discoveries of artists who work with ideas, will instantly transport mankind to unknown shores. Um, and this is a, um, a drawing of the, the, the Zhukov Tower. And um, the things about radio, which <laughs> Stepnikov loved, is it's against the written word. He hated the writing. He thought the writing was like for bureaucrats and executioners. Death warrants are written in that, in, in that language. And, he, was, and um, he hated borders. Radio doesn't care about borders. Radio's dimension is pure time. Like birdsong, it emanates from the sky. Nothing's fixed against bureaucrats. And humans with radio become speed of light people waves. He thought of humans in the future being kind of waves, um, strings, uh, vibrating strings. Um, sorry, what have we done? Vietje pienie, kavo i ochom, nietje pienie, mietje boit miachom. And the translation here is, it's wind is song, of whom and of what, of the swords longing to be the word. Now it's not quite accurate Russian because that's the, that's the swords longing to be a children's ball, a play ball. But, but the translation is, is accurate because the whole point of it is that Klimnik's idea is you take away the S from the sword and you've got a word. So his idea was that these, you, can, you can make a difference between life and death with a single consonant. Once you're in this realm of freedom because you've won your revolution and you've, you've escaped the previous realm of, um, of necessity. So, I mean, he, he, Klebnikov went with the Reds. He was, he was down on the Southern Front. He was with the Red Army in different, in different um, engagements. Uh, I sometimes wondered to myself, what exactly do these Red Army soldiers, you know, being recruited from, you know, peasant villages and town, what do they make of the lectures that Klebnikov gave? Because the, <laughs> the, le the, the lectures, lectures Klebnikov gave to these soldiers were all about the laws of time. Um, and he just wondered whether they were scratching their heads a bit, and quite what use Klebnikov was to the Red, to the Red Army. Um, but anyway, so he, and, and he, well, well, he was in Kharkov in 1920, and um, the, the, the town was, it was controlled by the Reds when he got there, then the Whites took over, then the Reds took over, then the Whites took over, and he, Klebnikov really didn't, you know, he wanted to be safe, so he went to the nearest, I should just switch this off, otherwise you'd be watching it. He, he went to the nearest um, kind of lunatic asylum, and demanded to talk to the, to the, uh, the director, and he managed to convince the director that he was completely mad. So he was admitted into the lunatic asylum. The trouble was, once, <laughs> once he was in the asylum, he found it really hard to get out again. <laughs> <laughs> and he caught typhoid in there. And although he, he just recovered, he, it, it affected his legs, and he never really did recover. And um, uh, he, he, he got quite a lot better, but um, two years later, he had gangrene in his legs, and he seems to have, um, seemed to have died of, of blood poisoning. So his um, friend Piotr Mituric, in his letter, wrote after he, uh, he died on June the 28th, 1922, on the 29th we buried him in a corner of the cemetery in Ruchiach. The priest there didn't allow him inside the fence of the cemetery since we were having a civil burial. But since there isn't another cemetery here, the executive committee ordered him put inside the fence and they gave him a place in the very end with the old believers. On the lid of his coffin there is depicted a blue planet, Earth, and the title, The President of Planet Earth, Velimir I.